Good morning, everyone. And happy Father's Day to all of you. So, today we are back in the book of Mark, and we're going to be in chapter 14, where Jesus is this what's called Holy Week in traditional church circles. It's the last week of Jesus' life. It's between his triumphal entry, which we see and we call Palm Sunday, and then what uh, many people call Easter, which is Resurrection Sunday. During that week is when all of this is happening. Uh, if you will, this is a busy Tuesday for Jesus. And so he's going to be going through uh, being tested. It's interesting because at this time during the Passover, the lambs are brought and those lambs are inspected to see if those lambs are up to snuff to be a sacrifice. And it's no different for Jesus here in this week where he's being tested and they're playing a little stump the teacher. And so everybody kind of gets a crack at it. The Herodians come, the Pharisees come, the Sadducees come. And so everybody's got questions, you know, and they've got their, you know, secret questions. You know, and they say, Jesus, is God, can he make a rock so big he can't move it? <laughs> so it's, it's one of those kind of things where they're trying to stump Jesus. So we'll get a good look at what Jesus does to respond. Today's key verse is, when they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and you care about no one. You guys read the Bible? You read this stuff? That you care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So... Uh, being, being good orators, they start with a compliment. And they go, we know that you don't care about anybody. <laughs> what they're saying is that he shows no favoritism. He's not a people pleaser. He's not afraid to tell you the truth just exactly as it is because he's not so concerned with your feelings as he is with speaking the truth. And yet he always does it in love, which is wonderful, and it's for our benefit. Uh, it's interesting. I was talking to Jenna about that today, speaking the truth in love. And so they come to him and they're going to ask him a question. Previously, we looked at Jesus going to Jerusalem. And as he was going, there was a fig tree with leaves. It had all the signs of life. And yet there was no fruit on the tree. And he curses the tree. And he says, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. He promptly then goes into uh, Palm Sunday, as we call it, and he rides in on the back of a donkey, and we looked at all of that, and how Jesus announced himself, kind of a false coronation as king, because the people a week later were crucified, crucify him, which is hardly receiving him as king. And the next day, as they're going back, Peter takes note, and he goes, hey, that tree you cursed, it's dead. One of Peter's finer moments of observation. <laughs> And yet we're the same way, aren't we? When Jesus does something and we're amazed. Uh, but it's, it said it wasn't time for fruit, but there are these little nubs that grow on the tree, which will indicate that fruit will be coming and they're actually edible. But there were none, which means that there would be no fruit. It's like not having any flowers on a plant here in Jersey. The flowers always indicate there'll be fruit following uh, for many garden plants. So Jesus cursed the tree and... Then as he passed this dead tree, he goes in and he casts everybody out of the temple because there's no fruit there either. They have all the activity and the showings of life, and yet they're living in complete hypocrisy. And so Jesus doing to the tree exactly what's going to happen to Israel in 70, 70 AD in Jerusalem when the Romans raise the temple and bring it to the ground. We looked last week at authority issues. So any of you who have authority issues, we, uh, you know, there are people who have authority issues about submitting to authority and how do I, you know, you're not my mother. You know, we have those kind of things. None of you, okay. Just, just the people I know outside of here. So this week, we're gonna look at Jesus being tested. He's gonna speak on three things here in the first chapter, uh, in the first half of chapter 12. He's going to talk about a vineyard, which I'm sure all of you have. He's going to talk about paying taxes, which I'm sure all of you do. 
And then he's going to talk about the resurrection and marriage um, and how they relate. And uh, so he's going to be asked some questions. And there's one more question after this that we're not going to get to because we just don't have enough time. But you've got to leave something for next week. So a vineyard. Jesus speaks in chapter 12, verse 1. Then he began to speak to them in parables. You guys know what a parable is, right? Para means alongside, and abao means to be cast. So it's a casting alongside. It's kind of a look at this and look at this kind of comparison. So para, parabole, if you want to sound Italian. (laughs) He's going to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge around it. He dug a place for the wine vat, and he built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers, and he went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the wine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. They told him, and they took him, and they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, And they sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed. And many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And so they took him and they killed him and they cast him out of the vineyard. Now this is in two other gospels. I have it listed here. So Jesus is telling a story. Now most of the parables that Jesus told, the people didn't get. And the disciples didn't even get it and they had to call him aside and say, Jesus, what what was that about? Because I don't have any idea. And he said, well, the kingdom of God is revealed to you in parables, but to everyone else, it's just a nice story. It's story time. And they said, well, could you fill us in? (laughs) Because we don't get it either. And so he does. But this one, they actually will get. Because he's speaking about a vineyard. Now, I don't know if any of you have a vineyard, but it's a giant project. If you want to get enough grapes to fill more than a bottle, it's going to take some work. He's speaking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of those who are well acquainted with the Old Testament. See if this sounds familiar. It's in Isaiah chapter 5. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and he cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. And so he expected it to bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, the men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. This parable is a parable of judgment against the people of Israel who were not bearing fruit in accordance with salvation. They had all of the semblance of having fruit, and yet they did not. And instead of producing nice grapes, a good fruit, a good return for what God had done with Jerusalem, what they returned was hypocrisy. And they rejected 
Jesus, the son of the living God, when he came to them. So Jesus is just retelling an Old Testament story, changing some of the things to fit the situation that he's in. Who's the one who planted the vineyard? God did. The vineyard is Israel, Israel or in this case, the city of Jerusalem. The people who were leased out this vineyard to are the religious rulers. And all of the prophets that were sent to Israel, all were prosecuted, persecuted, some of them killed, some of them beaten. Read the Old Testament, read through the prophets. Isaiah was sawn in two. It's a heck of a way to go. Zechariah was stoned on, you know, near the altar. Um, you, you got the prophets who spoke God's judgment on the people and the people didn't want to hear it and so they persecuted the prophets who came. Those are the ones who came to collect to see if there was fruit, but they found none. And then at last he says, I will send my son. Surely they will listen to him. Who's that? Jesus. It's Jesus. And he's predicting his death that's about to come in a few days. And they killed him and they threw him outside the wall. And you see, he was crucified outside the gate and that's also where he was buried. It's a very prophetic thing where Jesus turns into prophet and he's now prophesying of his own death and what they're going to do. Now you would think that they might be humiliated by that, but this is a religious festival and they're planning a murder. They've got all, think, all kinds of things to do. And they're planning a murder during one of the most holy weeks that they have in a year. It's, it's an amazing thing. And how they don't see that is, is a mystery. So Jesus is the one who's looking for fruit. And Jesus gives the rest of the story. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and will give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is what the Lord's, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude for they knew that they had spoken a parable against them. And so they left him and they went away. You see, they knew that Jesus was talking about them. And they were so ticked about it, they wanted to kill him, but they were afraid of the people. It's one of those times when people pleasing kind of works out okay because they wanted to please the people and they didn't want to get killed themselves by the people because if they rose up against Jesus at that point, there would be a, a riot on their hands because Jesus spoke the truth and the common men and women heard him gladly. They still do today. It's only the high and mighty that think they don't need a God and, you know, that... They're the ones who reject Jesus Christ or the ones that want to hold on to some pet sin in their life that they don't want to let go of. In Matthew 21, 43 to 44, it's a parallel passage to this. It says, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it, uh, bearing fruits of the kingdom of God. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So Matthew giving us a little bit more information. Mark is a bit more synoptic. He's, he's a bit more condensed in his, his version. Jesus likens himself unto a stone. And he says, I'm the chief cornerstone. And if you build on me, everything's going to go well. But if you don't, the stone is going to crush you to powder. In other words, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your savior, you will have to accept him as your judge. Yep. So, and there's this wonderful principle of exegetical consistency as we go through the scripture, when you see rock, rock is always Jesus, by the way. If you plug that in, you're gonna see it's pretty consistent all the way from Daniel's prophecy of a stone that comes hurling from heaven that's not been cut with human hands, uh, all the way to the book of Revelation, all the way through the book of Numbers when uh, Moses smacks the rock the first time and it gives water and the Lord says, next time speak to the rock and then he loses his temper and smacks the rock anyway and messes up 
what God wanted to communicate to the people, which is the first coming of Jesus Christ involved torture and pain. The second one will not. And so Jesus is that rock, and it says that that rock followed them, if you look in the book of Hebrews. So all of this rocking throughout the scripture, uh, if you plug Jesus in there, it sometimes will help you to make sense of the passage. But Jesus says, this is the rock. I'm the rock, that cornerstone. By the way, when the temple was being built, there's historical documents that say these rocks, by the way, these stones that were all put on top of another, they were made elsewhere in quarries far away from Jerusalem. You did not hear the sound of a hammer or chisel in Jerusalem. And uh, it's, it's, there's this little thing that's in there. There was not the sound of a chisel or a hammer in Jerusalem. And you go, why is that a big deal? All of the work was done in the quarry, and when it came to Jerusalem, it was just a matter of putting them in place, and they fit like you can't get a piece of paper between these things. It's, a, it's an amazing thing if you ever go there and see the way they're fitted. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the quarry right here, and God is chiseling away and banging away at us and making us because we're these living stones that he's helping. And then when we get to heaven, the work's done. There'll be no more chiseling, no more hammering because they'll just be putting us all together. Or maybe not. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. So there's a cornerstone. A cornerstone is everything. In fact, if you start with a cornerstone, that will tell you the direction of the building. That will tell you what's gonna be, what everything's going to get squared off of. Everything's going to get put on top of. That is the corner of the building. It has to be established and put in place. When they were building the temple, in the, in the historical documents, it's written that the, the, there was a stone that arrived on site and they couldn't identify it. They didn't know where it went. It didn't look like the others. And so they said, it must be a mistake. And so they dumped it in the Kidron Valley, which is their dump. And then they went looking around for the cornerstone and they couldn't find it. They said, I think we made a mistake here, boys. Like every good contractor. You make mistakes, you know. So they went to the Kidron Valley and got the stone, and sure enough, it was the cornerstone. So when Jesus says, it's this cornerstone that you builders rejected, you see it's a parallel to them rejecting Jesus Christ. And when you reject Jesus Christ, that the entire building is going to fall apart. And judgment comes, and we know in 70 AD that's exactly what happens, and not one stone is left upon another and it's completely torn down um, when, when uh, Titus Vespasian went in and leveled it in 70 AD. Here's this principle of expositional consistency. I'll give you a big, long vocabulary word for the day. In 1 Peter, Peter is writing about the stone. And he says, coming to him as a living stone. So Jesus is that living stone. Rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. By the way, this is called the universal priesthood of all believers, if you're looking for another big term. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Sean likes that part to which they were appointed. There were all of these things that happened throughout time that God knew. That not only God knew, but God allowed to happen, which includes all the footsteps of your life and mine. So why do we worry? Because we forget. I don't know about you, but remembering that God is present here in this moment with me here can be a struggle because my mind wants to go everywhere else. Like, 
what do we got going on today? What am I putting on the grill? Oh, yeah, I have to set it at low. And I don't know about you, but my mind works that way. And I have to tell it to shut up, smack it in the face, and get, his, get my eyes on Jesus. It's discipline. And I'd have none if it wasn't for the Lord. But he says, we are these spiritual stones. These living stones were being built up into a house, a spiritual house, making spiritual sacrifices. So this is the priesthood of all believers. We offer praise and worship to God, and God accepts it. You don't have to be a high priest. You don't have to be a Levite. You just need to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And Mark 4.12 says, so that seeing that they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Jesus said to the prophet, go and speak. And when you speak, you're going to say everything I tell you to say. And you know what? They're not going to listen. How'd you like that? How'd you like that calling? Yeah. I'm a pastor. God called me to be a pastor. Oh, yeah, what do you do? Well, I say everything God tells me to and nobody listens. They pay you well? No, not really. <laughs> Why in the world are you doing it? Because the Lord told me to. You know, sometimes God will want you to do something that's difficult, to say things that he wants you to say. Speaking truth and love. And you don't want to do it. It's like tearing a Band-Aid off. But there's a blessing in it because God is doing something. And if you are brave enough to be faithful, God will step in and make everything worthwhile. Taxes. That's always a great conversation around the dinner table, isn't it? Verse 13, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. By the way, that's a weird coupling of people. The Pharisees were the ultra conservatives. They were all about the letter of the law. They would strain at a gnat. If, they put a, if a gnat went into their mouth, they would freak out because maybe it was on an unclean animal. Not because they don't like bugs, but because ceremonially it might make them unclean. And yet they would <laughs> swallow a camel. Uh, so these folks were very fastidious and they were the conservatives, okay? The Herodians were backing Herod. Herod being an Idumean, he wasn't even Jewish, believe it or not, but they thought they were supporting somebody. They were all about peace and tranquility with the Romans. Let's just all get along, boys and girls. Let's just be nice. Let's play nice. We'll compromise in whatever way as long as there's peace. The Pharisees were like, they don't belong here. The Messiah is going to come and kick them out and kill them all. You have these two groups which are always fighting with each other, except they have a common enemy, who's Jesus. And so they have gotten together and teamed up. It's kind of like all of the Arab nations. All of the Arab nations would kill each other off if it wasn't for Israel. Because they... That's what they were doing before Israel was. They were killing each other off. It's an interesting thing. Sorry, I got political. <laughs> they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. They're on a mission to get this guy tripped up with his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. Uh, not that he doesn't care about anyone, but he's not favoritism. It's not about a favoritism thing. And you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. So we believe you're going to give us a good answer here, Jesus, uh, now that we complimented you. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? What do you think the Pharisees would say? Absolutely not. This is an invading nation who's taken us over and they're extracting payment from us. We should be extracting payment from them. The Herodians would be like, yeah, just give them, just give them money. We got to keep peace with these people. They'll kill us all. So these two groups don't even agree. And so they're going to put the test to Jesus. Now, if he says, yes, you should pay the taxes, he's offended half the people and probably everybody who doesn't want to pay taxes, which is everyone. 
And then if you say, no, you don't have to pay the taxes, now he's guilty of insurrection. And now Rome can come and capture him and they can put him to death and ta-da, mission accomplished. So either the people are going to kill him at the answer or the Romans will kill him with the answer. They, they love to do this. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, in other words, this wasn't a real compliment this guy gave. He said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. And so they brought it. I'm always sensitive when a, a magician says, does anyone have a hundred dollar bill? Because they'll take, they'll take the hundred dollar bill and in front of your eyes, it will disappear. See, and that's part of the joke. They just showed you a trick and it cost you $100. So Jesus says, give me a denarius. And by the way, a denarius is a day's wage. So whatever you would make in a day, uh, somewhere between, uh, in, in New Jersey, probably between $200 and $500 a day if you're a, a working person. So he's wait, waiting for a piece of money that is equal to that amount. And he says, you got a denarius that I might see it? And so they brought it to him. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is on this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. That means they went, hmm, that was a very good answer, Jesus. Well, you've got the Pharisees who are the ritualists. They write things into the word of God that isn't there. They've got big, thick books of extra things you need to do. They know exactly how much weight you are allowed to carry on the Sabbath. Nothing more than a couple of walnuts. I mean, they have, they've gone way overboard at adding to what God's word says. And you guys may have come out of some churches like that, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this, of course, you got to do that, and you got to do this, and you got to do the other thing. And, do it. and uh, you know, if you don't, then you got to go and, you know, do some heroic act or whatever. So those are the ritualists. And then you have the rationalists. The rationalists, like the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the prophets, so they, didn't, they just tore those out of the Bible. They only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament, which were written by Moses. They, ne they didn't believe in miracles, they didn't believe in the supernatural. And so you, you, got, you got two groups, and guess which one the Romans put into power? The liberals, the Sadducees, because they could get along with them. They could never get along with the Pharisees because the Pharisees always insisted you do what the word of God says. So I don't mind being called a Pharisee for that reason. So they are the rationalists. I mean, come on, really. God created everything in six days. Come on. I, I believe he did it over billions and billions of years. Wow. How big was the sun billions of years ago? Do you think it would reach to the earth? Yeah, I think it would. So how do you work that out? I don't know. Okay. Where'd all the stuff come from? I don't know. But there was a big bang. You mean there was a central location of creation? Oh. Oh. So we're talking the same language here. So do we pay taxes or don't we pay taxes? It's a question designed to trip Jesus up. And so uh, just to, the funny thing is, this conversation is hanging inside the temple. They're inside the temple. And by the way, there were money changers inside the temple and they weren't supposed to be. They're supposed to be outside the temple because the Pharisees especially would not let any foreign money into the temple because that's a graven image. You know, the second commandment? You guys know the second commandment, right? Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down and serve them. By the way, they usually cut it right there. <laughs> you can't have any images, no images at all. Well, it's funny because you walk inside the temple and there's images of things everywhere. There's angels. There's pomegranates. There's all sorts of beautiful colors. 
there's a, uh, you walk into Jerusalem through the East Gate and there's a giant vine and it was all overladen with gold and jewels and it was and it people just kept adding to it and it was a beautiful thing well that would have uh, definitely transgressed if you cut the verse in half but it says you don't make a graven image and you don't bow down and serve them see this is explicitly against idolatry right don't buy a new car and then be out there just washing it every day. You probably could apply that. Anyway, don't bow down and serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. In other words, it's going to mess up your family. Don't find idols. Don't make idols and worship these idols. And so they wouldn't let the picture of Caesar into the temple area. And yet, these people that said, hey, should we pay taxes or not? Jesus says, you got a denarius? Oh yeah, I got one right here in my pocket. What are you doing with that in the temple? That's not supposed to be in your pocket. So if you have a problem with paying taxes, why is it have you bought into the system? Because it's in your pocket. And not only that, you're in the temple with it. So Jesus says, show me a denarius. Oh, I got one. It's like, Jesus, do you think because marijuana is legal that everyone should smoke it? And Jesus says, I don't know. Give me a joint. Go, okay. <laughs> do you understand that's what's happening? What are you doing? You're asking a question. You don't want an answer. You've already made up your mind. Do you ever have people ask you a question they already have their mind made up? You can smell it, right? It's like, I have a question. Okay, here it comes. And it's not that the answer matters. It's like, well, John the Baptist, was the baptism from heaven or from man? You answer me and then I'll answer you. Oh, you don't know. Okay, well, then you're not going to know by what power I do it. You see, Jesus does that because people already have their mind made up. Be wise. Don't waste your time. Don't sit there and argue with people online. I can't believe it. Oh. <laughs> you guys don't do that, right? Somebody said something, you know, like blaspheme. And, and just, <laughs> Jesus just said, render unto Caesar's what's Caesar's. Give unto God what's God's. Oh, well, by the way, what is God's? Everything's God's, right? So what do you think he wants? You think he wants your money? The IRS wants your money. Do you think God wants your money? That's part of everything, isn't it? You give to Caesar what is Caesar's, what is rightfully Caesar's. You give to God what is rightfully God's, which is everything. So whose image is carved on you? You see, the other side of the coin is this. You render unto Caesar those things with Caesar's pictures on. Why don't you render yourself to God since his image is on you? Because it says in the beginning, God created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. In other words, something about male and female is the image of God. And it's the only creature on this earth that has the image of God imprinted. So how are you doing with that? How are you doing with showing the image of God to the world and rendering unto God what's God? You know what, you know what is God's? My time, my talents, and my treasures. Everything I have is his. Except we, we try to hold, hold on to something secret for ourselves, and that's what ruins everything. Matthew 17, Jesus talks about paying taxes here too. When he had come to Capernaum, those who would receive the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And he said, yes. <laughs> Not really knowing whether Jesus did pay the temple tax or not, Peter, who's impetuous, gave the answer, yes. Not really knowing. You know how I know that? Because I read ahead. <laughs> and when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying and said, what do you think, Simon? From whom did the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Interesting question. And Peter said to him, from strangers, not from your family members, right? And Peter said to him, 
from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take out the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for you and me. So should we be paying the tech temple tax or not? No, you're right. We shouldn't have to. But just so we're not upsetting people, I'll tell you how to do this. Go fishing. You do that, right, Pete? You've done that. Go fishing, and the first fish you find, there'll be a piece of money in his mouth. And it just so happens there'll be exactly enough for me and you. I like the way to pay taxes like that. It's not, a, and they call this fish uh, on the Sea of Galilee St. Peter's fish for this very reason. It's a tilapia. And tilapia, very often when they see something shiny, they will go after it like it's a fish. And they have found all sorts of metal objects in the mouths of these fish, just so that you understand. Like if you go fishing and you use a lure, right? It, okay, you don't go fishing. Anyway, so Jesus agrees with paying taxes just so people don't get perturbed. So Romans 13 gives us a more extensive explanation of it. Paul writing to the Romans, he says, let every soul be subject, that means to submit, to the governing authorities. By the way, he's writing this while Rome is occupying Israel. So you say, oh, we couldn't mean now. That clown that's voted in now, are you kidding me? It was worse. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God, sometimes for judgment. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. By the way, that's what all public servants are. Whether they remember it or not, it might be good for you to remind them. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister or servant, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake, because you know better. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For there are God's they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all that is due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to to whom honor. So there's a propriety and there's an order in which we show obedience. But understand that there is no authority that we're to like, nah, I don't agree with that. Unless it's in violations of God's word, which is, I want you to kill your kid. Or I want you to uh, lie, steal. I want you to do these things which are against God. Well, then that's worth losing your life for. Nope. When you make the sound of the horn and, and all of that and everybody bows down to worship this image of me and you stand up, you might lose your life. But you know what? The Lord's there. He'll be there in the midst of the fire. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I feel like I have to explain everything. It's, it, I'm losing my voice. Anyway, Jesus goes into another topic, resurrection and marriage, two hot topics beginning with verse 18, and some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying, teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. By the way, you'll find this in the book of Deuteronomy. It's called a Leverite marriage. If I die, my brother is to take my wife and all my stuff and inherit it and have a child and name him after me. <laughs> 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 
how would you like that sort of an arrangement, ladies? <laughs> Makes you think twice before you get married. You're like, you know, I, I'm digging you, but I haven't met your brother yet. <laughs> this was because women possessed nothing. They had no possessions. And if there was a death, it, the, the property and all of the goods would go into the family and disappear. And you would then be homeless and have nowhere. That was the way that it was back then. So there's a provision so that somebody within the family takes responsibility, raises up children in your name, and the ones who uh, slough that off and are disobedient uh, paid the price with their life. Uh, there are scriptural evidence of that. Anyway, so he took his wife and dying and left no offspring. And the second brother took her and died, and nor did he leave any offspring. And the third, likewise, and so the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, which they don't believe in, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven have had her as a wife. Do you see how they're the rationalists? Who, who's going to be the husband to this woman in heaven? You ever have somebody give you an impossible question like that? I felt like it was on Jeopardy, you know. Jeopardy. He was a he was a Canadian. Alex Trebek, Alex Trebek was from Canada, and any time the answer involved a Canadian, he was always good to make sure everybody knew. And he was a Canadian. <laughs> Trivia. But they're they're questioning Jesus. So there's seven seven brothers and the wife marries the youngest one and he dies and the next one and he dies and the next one and there's seven brothers that die in a row. They call that a black widow. <laughs> there's a problem if you've got seven men dying from one woman. Right? Can, can you imagine being the seventh one saying, uh, can we work something out here? So they're asking Jesus this ridiculous question. It's, it's like a straw man. He's going to throw it up and, and see if it survives and if Jesus can give a good answer. And Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? So Jesus throws them to the canvas. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. It doesn't say they are angels. Just so you know, people don't become angels when they go to heaven. That's a misreading. They become like the angels. Okay, now, what is it to be like an angel? First of all, they're single. And in heaven, they don't reproduce. And there's no marriage. Everybody's married to one another in the purest and best possible way. And concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage? I, I love you didn't say chapter and verse. <laughs> it wasn't a chapter and verse. You're so smart. <laughs> if you read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, meaning Moses, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So he told them, number one, you don't know nothing about the supernatural because you're a bunch of Sadducees and you don't believe the word of God. Jesus told them right exactly the way it was. They gave him this complicated Jeopardy question. He said, you guys are twisted. You should need to believe God and believe his word. Question. Is the presence of God living in you? Is the image of God imprinted upon you in such a fashion that it radiates to the people around you? Do the people at work wonder why you don't have a meltdown like everybody else? Do they ever wonder why you come early, stay late, why you're willing to sacrifice, pay your taxes, 
I surely hope you pay your taxes. The presence of God should be seen very clearly in our lives, and we should never have somebody say, you're a real sad excuse for a Christian. Because our testimony about who God is is really way more important than any convenience that we might put into our lives or any pleasure we might take. Are you radiating Christ? I ask myself that question, and I can do better. How about you? So that's the conclusion of the first half of Mark chapter 12, where Jesus is being grilled. Next week, we're going to see Jesus being grilled, but he's going to fire back because these guys are off base. Jesus strikes back. <laughs> and he's going to straighten out the Pharisees, and he's going to straighten out, or he's going to make an attempt, and hopefully, if our hearts are going in any way in that direction, we too will be corrected. So uh, by all means, I'll see you next week. <laughs>